Hello and welcome back to the sixth episode of the Old Code Podcast. I'm your host, and today we're talking about urban planning of all things. We're talking about how we lay out our cities, how we lay out our towns, but more so, this is a conversation on how we center and what we think of as the center of our communities. So, as a groundwork, I'm going to mention that these are general principles and general things that I've noticed. They are not universals. They are not going to be found in every single location you may go. But these are just some stuff that I've noticed, really. So, I hope that you walk away from this conversation encouraged and enlightened and maybe thinking about how we build our communities a little bit more. So I want to start off chronologically. So in the classical period of ancient Greece and ancient Rome, the town center or what this, the community was really built around was usually temples. They were built around Two primary things, I should say, actually, temples and markets. In certain communities, you also had uh, performance areas, essentially, where theater would take place or where sports would be enacted. But the primary center for communities was usually going to be temples and markets. And this makes sense, really. You need two things in order to live. You need a god who you can appease, and you need food to put on the table. And then from there, you build around that, and you have homes, and you have government buildings, and you know where the senates would meet, or where, for ancient Greece, where the republic, or the the people would come to vote, and all of the above. You'd usually have on the outskirts of the town. Uh, Plato's academy or Socrates' academy would be on the outskirts of town Uh, and that was mostly just because it was a location that was not already occupied and therefore it was a good place for everybody to meet is particularly in Athens what you have was the Acropolis Acro being high and opolis or polis being a city. This was the high location and on top of it was built the temple to, if I'm remembering correctly, Athena and there was another smaller uh, dedicated to Poseidon. But the idea to be communicated was this was a high place. This was meant to be where gods and men would meet. It was man rising up to meet God, or their gods. Uh, Not God in the monotheistic sense, not yet at least. So, you have this being communicated as the Greek and Roman communities were centered around their worship and their appeasement of a deity. They were also centered around the marketplace of both ideas, which would be the academy, and marketplace of physical goods, which would be the agora. Uh, the Spartans would have their agoge, and that would be where are the Spartans, and I believe a couple other cultures had effectively agoges, which were dedicated to the training up of young children, particularly young boys in these cultures. <clears throat> Once ancient Greece and ancient Rome effectively move out of the way with the mass adoption of Christianity in Europe, what you start seeing is Roman culture start morphing into a Christianized culture, effectively speaking, especially as uh, Catholicism starts picking up steam. And there are certain rules in medieval Europe that are established in urban planning and urban design. The primary rule 
as far as urban design was in concerning the building of cathedrals and in particular building other homes and buildings in relation to cathedrals. And what I mean by that is the cathedral was always the only building that, or it was the tallest building. It was all, it was the building that was, that had to be the tallest. No other building could be as tall as the cathedral. And this was to communicate two things. It was to communicate the ascendancy of the church itself. It was also to communicate the fact that everybody else could see it. And what I mean by ascendancy is this was reaching up towards the heavens. It wasn't so much man's attempt at reaching God. It was simply this was something which was towering and reaching up toward God. So it wasn't striving to meet God halfway. It was just a building that was meant to communicate God's presence. And that was really why no other building could infringe upon its presence in effectively the cityscape. Uh, one large thing that you can note is, uh, particularly in the European locations I've visited, when you climb up to the top of one of these cathedrals, you almost see rings like you would in a tree. These towns are built not so much in concentric circles, but you can see how the city effectively radiates from these cathedrals. And again, what this is meant to communicate uh, in the city being built around these cathedrals, and again, this is cathedrals, these aren't always necessarily churches, these are primary cities. In the smaller towns and the like, usually the churches would be built on the outside of the perimeters, and that was just because it was meant to denote that it was other. It was other uh, than the world. Very communicative of Two Kingdoms-esque theology. However, for these massive cathedrals that everything seems to radiate from, that's the primary thing which is being communicated. It's the idea that life comes out and is born of the church itself. Uh, another interesting thing to note when it comes to not only medieval urban planning, but even medieval cathedral design, these cathedrals, it was common understanding that the lay person could not possibly understand the deeper things of scripture. They couldn't understand the deeper truths of theology. And so these buildings, and oftentimes the ways that these cities would be laid out, they were meant to communicate these deeper truths in visual means. Uh, a lot, it's one of the reasons why cathedrals are often rife with symbolism and imagery. It's meant to communicate something which is greater than itself. For all the grandiosity that a cathedral possesses, or even a church, one of the small chapels would possess, these were always meant to communicate things which are greater than the building themselves. They were always meant to point back towards God. <clears throat> And that's really where community was derived. The life of the town, the life of the city, was built around churches. And you had two, two prominent, typically you had two prominent buildings or building projects. You had the cathedral, and then you had the fort. Sometimes the cathedral or church would be built within the fort, but again, you have two prominent buildings, very much like you had in ancient Greece where you had two prominent areas. You have the fort, which is the defensible location, which is where you can be protected from by outside forces. And then the cathedral, which is where you are effectively protected from by, or protected by uh, God from 
spiritual and demonic forces. This is a safe place. That was always what it was meant to communicate was this is safe from the powers of sin and death. I'm not going to get into the theology really behind that, but that is effectively what these things were attempting to communicate in the way they were designed. Even the routes in the city uh, during processions in times of Easter or the uh, ascension of Mary, all of these different feasts, there were specific routes laid out through cities typically in order to communicate truths or communicate what they perceived as true. Um, and this again goes back to our conversation on truth, goodness, and beauty. Uh, beauty is something, and I'll add a caveat to some, to what I said last time, truth, goodness, and beauty inherent to th anything is meant to point to something greater than itself. Uh, a factual truth, a loving truth, always points to the creator which established such a truth. Goodness always points toward the goodness of God, who is the most good. Anything beautiful is only beautiful because it participates and partakes in God's beauty. All beauty, all truth, all goodness, they're a derivative of God's beauty. And so when they were laying out these towns, the goal and the desire was to point back to God and to communicate greater truths in common means. <clears throat> so really that's the that was the medieval philosophy behind certain architectural and urban design principles. Moving on, uh, you don't really start seeing much of a difference until you start getting into I want to say 17, 1800s uh, America. Uh, in, you, you see this in old towns still, where you know the, the church was the primary thing. Uh, a lot of new, towns in New England were built on the principle that they were effectively new Jerusalems uh, or new cities of God. So you still see certain aspects of medieval building principles in old towns. You see this to some degree or another in, in someone where like Boston. Uh, <clears throat> however, what eventually supplanted that, and again, this is a general principle, what eventually supplanted that was the building or communities around town halls or courthouses. Uh, we even have this to some degree in our state capitals. The Capitol building could the design in most capital buildings is very reminiscent of the same classical architecture could be compared to the Vatican even in a very real way uh, because it's meant to draw on the neoclassical look it's presented in neoclassical I should say <clears throat> however where something like the Vatican or somewhere like a cathedral is meant to point to God. These town halls, these state uh, centers, these capitals, they're always meant to communicate the power of man, truly. Uh, it's communicating the power of democracy. It's communicating the power of, this is what happens when people can come together and communicate what they desire and come together for a consensus. And truly, that's all democracy is, is consensus of opinions. So where the classical and medieval idea was built on how do we, how do we communicate God and how do we communicate to God, the more modern and American neoclassical urban design is centered on man's will. It's centered around, we're building our towns, not around a source of life, but a source of order. And that source of order is not, in, in fact, God. That source of order is man. It's man's will, it's man's rationality, 
towns are built around the idea of man's own rationality as opposed to God's established order. So in a very real sense, I, I just want to lay this out for you, for your own consideration and for the way you think, possibly even about how we lay out our government. We have our officials swear on the Bible. I know recently they've started allowing multiple air quotes, sacred texts for people to swear on. But ultimately, their oaths are only as good as their word. And if governments and politicians are to be taken, the quality of their word, uh, that's not exactly the best litmus test for how we consider them. But in your mind and in how you develop community, how are you synthesizing a community? Are you building it on your own desires, your own rule and reign? Are you building it on your own sense of right and privilege? Or are you building a community built on God and are you building it on truth, goodness, and beauty? If I were to... <clears throat> Sorry, I'm thinking. If I were to desire to construct a city, yes, you'd have at the very heart of it, you would have the church. And that would be I don't just say the heart of it because it's central. I'm saying the church is the source for any true life in a community. Communities that lack living, breathing churches always end up being the most destitute and they always end up being the most depraved. You can take San Francisco or New York or Chicago as a key example of such. But really, we want to build our communities on three fundamental things. The first being church. People are no good if you don't have a rooting in God. The second would be the academy, which should be a no-brainer. It's the means by which we train up our youth, not just in mental things, but in emotional things, in physical things. We ought to be training our, our communities to be participating in the world, not just mentally, but physically. Like I mentioned in previous episode on the digital age. But also we should be building around hospitals. So we train and treat the soul. God treats the soul, really, but he uses us. So I want to recognize secondary causality and secondary means. But... We treat the soul, we treat the mind, and we treat the body. And in that, if we focus on these three things, markets will come later, but our city skylines are marred by state capitals, town squares, and skyscrapers, which basically say that the highest things that we can strive toward and the most complex and technical things we can strive towards are ultimately things of industry and things of democracy. We should be striving to make our churches beautiful and we should be striving to make our churches lasting because our communities are not just singular generational entities. Our communities are multi-generational. There's so much more to how the world is built and we give credit for because we think of this very disenchanted way. But I think that's all I'm going to say for now. Um, I could talk for hours on American building standards, but I think I'll save that for another time. In any case, I hope this episode encourages you to think about how we structure, how you structure your life how you structure authority, how you think about 
what we build and why we build it. And maybe to not be so quick to judge when we see a cathedral stretching towards the heavens. In any case, this was the Old Code Podcast. I hope you are left encouraged, and I hope you are left hopeful for potentially better ways to move forward into the future.